This is A Rude Awakening. I'm Sabrina Jacobs. On today's show, I'll speak to solution-based organization Project Drawdown and get their take on the latest IPCC report released this week, which focuses on, guess what? Solutions. Ms. Jamie Alexander is back on the show along with Dr. Jonathan Foley. But first, the news. I'm Max Pringle with these headlines. A Russian missile strike on a crowded train station in eastern Ukraine killed dozens of people evacuating the area. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky said thousands of people had been waiting to board trains at the station when the missile struck. Photos showed bodies covered with tarps on the ground and the remnants of a rocket with the words for the children painted on it in Russian. The Russian Defense Ministry denied attacking the station in the city of Kramatorsk. Ukrainian officials say cluster munitions were used in the attack. Cluster munitions are banned under international law. Ukrainian officials say Russian forces have almost completely withdrawn from northern Ukraine and are turning their attention to the east of the country where Ukrainian forces are digging in for a renewed attack. And Ukrainian officials say they expect to find more evidence of atrocities in areas abandoned by Russian forces. Feature Story News' Ali Barrett has more. Volodymyr Zelensky claims the situation in Borodyanka is much worse than in nearby Bucha. Hundreds of civilians were found dead there when Russian forces withdrew. David Miliband, the head of the International Rescue Committee, says the conflict is shifting. The Russian retreat means that there are more parts of the country where it's safer and where access can take place. But there are these battle zones in the south and the east which remain very dangerous. And in the case of Mariupol, absolutely strangled. UK intelligence says it believes that Russian forces have now fully withdrawn from northern Ukraine to Belarus and Russia. Some of those forces, the UK's Ministry of Defence believes, will transfer to eastern Ukraine to fight in the Donbass region. From Feature Story News in London, I'm Ollie Barrett. Newly confirmed Supreme Court Justice Ketanji Brown-Jackson will appear at the White House today for remarks... President Biden invited her following the Senate vote Thursday, confirming her as the first black woman to serve on the nation's highest court. Christopher Martinez reports. On this vote, the yeas are 53, the nays are 47, and this nomination is confirmed. With that historic vote, the Senate has acted to make Federal District Court Judge Ketanji Brown-Jackson the 216th Justice to serve on the U.S. Supreme Court and the first African-American woman to be confirmed. Judge Jackson is scheduled to join President Joe Biden and Vice President Harris at the White House Friday for public remarks. She'll take the oath of office after Justice Stephen Breyer retires at the end of the Supreme Court's term, likely in late June or early July. After that, for the first time in the Supreme Court's history, white men will make up a minority on the bench. Reporting for Pacifica Radio News KPFA, I'm Christopher Martinez. Alabama lawmakers have approved legislation that would outlaw transgender treatments for teens. The sweeping legislation would deny transgender youth access to gender-affirming medications. They also approved a separate measure that would require students to use bathrooms corresponding to their sex at birth and to limit instruction of gender and sexual identity in early grades. The Alabama House of Representatives voted in favor of the medication ban measure Thursday by a 66-28 vote. It passed previously in the Senate. Both bills now go to Republican Governor Kay Ivey. Proponents argued the bills are needed to protect children. Opponents argued they do the opposite. The bill makes it a felony to prescribe puberty blockers or hormones to trans youth under age 19. Israeli security forces say they killed a Palestinian man who opened fire into a crowded bar in central Tel Aviv and killed two people. They say the attacker was tracked down after an overnight manhunt and killed in an exchange of gunfire with police. It was the fourth deadly attack in Israel by Palestinians in less than three weeks and came at a time of heightened tensions around the start of the Islamic holy month of Ramadan. Protests and clashes in Jerusalem during Ramadan last year ignited the 11-day Gaza War. Tens of thousands of people attended weekly prayers today in Jerusalem with no immediate reports of unrest. 
With things returning to normal as COVID-19 recedes, readjusting to the workplace may take some doing for many people. And as public news services Tramel Gomes reports, it's okay to ask employers for reasonable safety precautions. Jane Marks is a licensed mental health counselor in Tallahassee. She says going back is a big shift, and it's perfectly reasonable to ask for things, like perhaps an office by a window. She recommends using the transition as an opportunity for positive change. The idea of going back to a work situation where you may have a little bit more control than you thought you had. You know, people need you. They need you on the ground. They need boots on the ground. Well, you're part of those boots. Marx adds that the pandemic has also shifted the idea of self-care. She says it's no longer a reward, but a requirement in terms of how we could manage our lives with balance. She recommends listening to our bodies, giving ourselves grace, being patient through stressful situations, eating right, exercising, and getting enough sleep. I'm Tramel Gomes. A House committee took up the issue of increasing energy efficiency as a way of fighting climate change Thursday. The debate centered on whether transitioning to renewables or alternatives like natural gas would be more effective. Ellie Prickett Morgan reports. Florida Democrat Kathy Castor opened the hearing at the House Select Committee on Climate Crisis, reminding lawmakers of what's at stake for Americans in a climate emergency. We're behind. We're late. And we're running out of time. Representative Castor's warning comes after a new report released by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change claiming that emissions will have to peak by 2025 in order to keep global warming under 1.5 degrees Celsius. Natural gas came up repeatedly as a cleaner alternative to traditional fossil fuels and a cheaper alternative to the expensive upfront costs of electrification. I'm Ellie Prickett Morgan reporting for KPFA. Officials say a suspect arrested in connection with Sunday's mass shooting in Sacramento would likely still have been in prison were it not for corrections officials' use of early release credits authorized by voters in 2016. Smiley Martin was released in February after serving less than half his 10-year sentence. He was arrested Tuesday on suspicion of possession of a firearm by a convicted felon and possession of a machine gun. The California District Attorney's Association Association's executive offer says Martin typically would not have been freed until at least May were it not for earlier release credits. Sunny today in the San Francisco Bay Area, high is in the upper 70s, lows tonight in the mid 40s. In the central San Joaquin Valley, sunny and warm, highs in the mid 90s, overnight lows in the mid 50s. I'm Max Pringle. News returns at noon with headlines and again at 3 and 4. And tune in for the Pacifica Evening News at 6. A rude awakening is next. And we are back. We are back. This is a rude awakening. I'm Sabrina Jacobs. The sixth IPCC report, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, was just released on the 4th of April, 2022. I'm going to leave it at that, folks, because by now you all know, if you've been listening to the show, um, the IPCC, they've been putting out reports, report after report after report about what's happening to our climate, to our environment. Um, This time around, they've included solutions. And I've got two amazing folks here to talk about it. Um, We're going to start with Dr. Jonathan Foley. Now, they're both from Project Drawdown. Dr. Jonathan Foley is a world-renowned environmental scientist, sustainability expert, author, and public speaker. Uh, His work focuses on understanding our changing planet and finding new solutions to sustain the climate, ecosystems, and natural resources we are all all dependent on, I should say. Um, Dr. Jonathan Foley, welcome to A Rude Awakening. Great. Well, thanks for having me here today. Appreciate it. Appreciate you taking the time. And then we also have Jamie Alexander. And uh, Jamie is uh, the founding director of Drawdown Labs, which is a a portion or a facet of uh, Project Drawdown. And uh, Jamie Beck Alexander, I should say, is a solutions-oriented corporate climate advocate coalition builder. And she joined the Project Drawdown team from Ceres, where she led corporate engagement on the West Coast, working with companies to set ambitious emissions reduction targets and leverage their influence in support of strong climate and clean energy policies. Jamie Alexander, thank you so much for being on A Rude Awakening once again. Thanks for having me. 
All right. So we're going to start with Dr. Jonathan Foley. Um, talk to us about this IPCC report, this Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Uh, it's a facet or faction of the UN, the United Nations, and they have included solutions. Now, your organization that you're executive director of, it that's all you guys do. That's all you guys talk about are solutions, coming up with solid solutions. So um, let's do a compare and contrast uh, as far as what came out in the IPCC report and uh, what Project Drawdown has been working on. Go right ahead. Yeah, well, Project Drawdown's been around for a number of years now, and as you said, uh, that's that's our business is focusing on climate solutions. So that's that's basically all we do. Uh, we look at solutions across like electricity and food, industry, transportation, buildings, basically everywhere, and try to vet them to say, you know, hey, which ones make sense? Uh, how big could they be? What would they cost? How would they work? And um, instead of putting them into highly technical scientific publications, uh, we write them for kind of the larger public audience uh, through books, through uh, videos, through talks, uh, through you know pretty engaging materials, also short stories and other things as well. So, um, you know, that's what we do. Um, the IPCC is a, a much more formal process. It's actually a part of a United Nations framework to address climate change where they ask the world's scientific uh, community, thousands and thousands of people, to work together with one voice over a period of years to write a very large, fairly technical tome. This report was 3,000 pages. And if you ever need a cure for insomnia, it would be to try to read one of these things. Um, but it's important because it kind of sets the bar for where the science is in a more technical way, but also in a much more organized kind of diplomatic way where countries all have to sign off approving this report. So we're kind of small and nimble and can you know, move quick on these things and uh, I've done a lot more and probably a little bit more understandable. Uh, but the IPCC report is kind of the uh, kind of the gold standard of international scientific cooperation. So they're both really important, and we're really excited to see what they've said, which is very complementary to a lot of the things we've been saying too. Interesting, yeah. So let me give a really quick uh, background on Project Drawdown. Apologize for that, dear listener. Founded in 2014, Project Drawdown is a nonprofit organization that seeks to help the world reach Drawdown, the future point in time when levels of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere stop climbing and start to steadily decline. Now, since 2017, since the 2017 publication of the New York Times bestseller, Drawdown, the organization has emerged as a leading resource for information and insight about climate solutions. Can, uh, they continue to develop that resource by conducting rigorous review and assessment of climate solutions, creating compelling and human communications, communication across media and partnering with efforts to accelerate climate solutions globally. So, yeah, small but powerful, I might add. Drawdown, projectdrawdown.org, folks. Check it out, projectdrawdown.org. So, they're starting to, the world is starting to focus on climate solutions. Project Drawdown's been doing it uh, since its inception. Mm -hmm. um, let's drill down a little bit more. Um, you, you, you mentioned energy. I uh, mentioned uh, so that would that would uh, involve uh, EV vehicles or electronic ve or electric vehicles. Um, there's the solar panels, right? Uh, we've got this issue here in the state of California or in the state of California where they're trying to uh, the energy sector is trying to charge people who are trying to help with this climate, so trying to create climate solutions by charging more for having solar panels. Um, so there's that policy issue, and that's what we can talk to uh, Jamie about in, in a few. Um, there's also, uh, you know, just mitigating uh, the multinational corporations, how they're, they're uh, running roughshod on the global south. Um, in destroying agroecology, there's that issue. So, um, yeah, well, well, first of all, I, it's not very helpful to think of like energy as one thing. I, I don't, I, I kind of like to dissuade people from lumping all forms of energy into one bucket because they're, they're not. Sure. Um, <clears throat> there's electricity. Um, that's really important. Globally, about 25% of our greenhouse gas emissions comes from making electricity, uh, burning coal and natural gas to power our electrical system. Um, we need to do better there. 
Uh, we also have to do better in transportation where we use energy in a different form, a gasoline tank that we fill up and power around these dirty engines uh, that burn this stuff and, and spew it out the tailpipe. That's a different form of energy. And then we have like buildings which use natural gas usually to heat them or electricity to cool them, which is kind of a, also an opportunity to do better. And of course, industry uh, where we make stuff like steel and you know plastics and all the things we buy and throw away later. Uh, that's kind of another area where energy is used, but often in very different forms. So I tend to like to walk through like these kind of economic sectors, like electricity, food, industry, transportation, and buildings. Just those five things produce 90, about well, 90% of the greenhouse gases that go into the atmosphere. Again, electricity, food, industry, transportation, and buildings. Those are the five big places to focus our ability to cut emissions. Uh, what we find all the time in our research, but the IPCC also sees this in their analysis too, is the best thing to do first is to be a lot more efficient with our use of resources, whether it's electricity uh, or food or you know transportation or whatever. We could be more efficient even with our current systems that are powered with fossil fuels and big industrial agriculture. That stuff sucks, but we could at least be better about being more efficient with it, use less of it. So, you know, in electricity, it's like energy efficiency. It means more uh, efficient lighting, more efficient appliances, more efficient um, use of our buildings, especially air conditioning, uh, all those kinds of things. That's always, always, always a good place to start is efficiency. Let's use less resources, but still have the quality of life we want. We still want refrigerators to cool our food and keep it safe. Lights, uh, you know, we want to listen to music and do all these things. We can do that but with efficiency first. Yeah. And then second, I would say, is <clears throat> then pivoting to a different way of providing those resources. Like in electricity, we can be more efficient with electricity use, first of all, but then later, uh, or alongside that, I should say, we can make electricity greener uh, by not burning coal or natural gas or other things that cause climate change and instead replace them with, like you mentioned, uh, solar is you know one of the top solutions there. Uh, wind turbines, both onshore and offshore, uh, is geothermal, there's uh, hydropower, there's some biomass power, there's a little bit of nuclear left in the United States, some other countries will build more. There are lots of energy sources out there that can produce electricity that don't burn coal and gas. And that's what we got to do. But efficiency first, while we're pivoting to the low carbon, greener alternative. And the good news is a lot of these solutions have gotten cheaper and better and bigger in the last 10 years or so, especially solar, especially LED lighting, especially batteries, and soon things like electric vehicles and heat pumps. When, they, when these things start to get cheaper, and especially when they get cheaper than the old fossil fuel way of doing things, that's when they start to really take off. Uh, solar and wind now are the cheapest sources of electricity on the planet, uh, mm -hmm. way cheaper than coal, natural gas, or nuclear. That's a good day. When electric vehicles are cheaper to buy and cheaper to operate, they're already cheaper to own over the lifetime of the car. But when they're cheaper to buy up front than the old internal combustion engine vehicle, that can be a good day too. So we have a lot of opportunities here to bring up um, big climate solutions, but always starting with efficiency while we're doing the big green pivot, which is going to take a little bit longer. No doubt, no doubt. And it's just a, it's, it's a literally <laughs> a breath of fresh air to see the, the, the wind turbines, uh, the farms, I guess they're calling them, right? Uh, just out there and they're, they're doing their thing. It's like, okay, this, you know, there's, there is change in the air, literally. This is wonderful. <laughs> yeah. You know, so it's always wonderful to see, see that and to see them in uh, various areas, you know, not just uh, in, in our backyards, literally, but, you know, when you go out and you're traveling and seeing that, that uh, yeah. cities and municipalities are saying, hey, you know, we're going to do this. This is, this is going to be our new policy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, exactly. And this What's great about this is that um, solar, wind, and now with cheap battery storage and other things that are not perfect yet, uh, they're not you know going to do everything that we need them to do, but they're getting better and cheaper and uh, larger than anything we ever projected. Uh, solar, for example, large-scale solar farms especially, are the cheapest form of energy production in all of human history, and they're still falling in price. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty cool. Um, now, we still have problems of like, you know, hey, these things are made out of materials we're going to go mine and figure out how to recycle later. But fortunately, solar panels are pretty easy to recycle. 
Uh, there's no moving parts and they last a really long time and they don't pollute while they're being used. That's a good thing, but we have some issues there. Uh, we also have to figure out how to store energy. So, you know, we can still use energy at night, obviously, and things like this. That's mixing solar, wind, some storage, hydro, and other sources together. There's lots of ways to do that. But it's going to take a little while to sort out all of it. But the early days are here, and uh, they've been pretty promising. Um, but everything we can do to, again, be more efficient up front is a big win. And then that makes it easier to use renewables and other kind of uh, great climate solutions Um if we're more efficient, same, if you don't mind, I jump into like food for a second. Food globally is equal to electricity in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. They're both about a quarter mm-hmm. of the total greenhouse gases going to the atmosphere. One quarter from making electricity, the other quarter from making food. Um, and a lot of that comes from deforestation or methane coming from livestock or overusing fertilizers. But food waste is a huge deal. Um, 30 to 40% of all the food on the planet is never eaten. Now, what if we could redirect that to people who are hungry or not have to grow much of some of it ever because it was just wasted anyway? That means 30 to 40% of all the land and water and chemicals and labor and greenhouse gases associated with growing food probably weren't even needed. So how can we be better about food waste? Just kind of like energy efficiency, there's also food efficiency. So that's why I always like to lead with food and efficiency first while we're also doing the green pivot with agriculture. How do we move from highly industrialized, pretty energy intensive deforestation centric forms of agriculture to something that's far better for the environment, far better for people, far better for food security and just good all around. Uh, But again, starting with food efficiency, let's waste less, let's eat better diets, and then let's also figure out how to grow it smarter. Most definitely. Absolutely. This is, uh, it sounds like something that can be plugged into the uh, donut economy or donut economics by, uh, oh my God, Kate, I want to say Kate Hawthorne or something like that. Mm -hmm. English lady, super deep, very, very well versed uh, on the economic side of um, everything (laughs) as well as uh, the climate solutions. So I would love to have her on the show sometime. Yeah, it's Kate Raworth. Um, We actually just wrote a report last week uh, called Drawdown Lift that looks at how we can solve climate change and help alleviate extreme poverty around the world. People who still live under $1.90 a day in some parts of the world. Uh, We found like win-win solutions within that kind of donut economics framework of how can we help improve human well-being while simultaneously living more within the environmental limits of our planet. And there are win-wins. Uh, we found 28 of them, in fact, <laughs> when we looked uh, very carefully in a report we just published last week. So, yeah, we love the donut economics framework. It's uh, yeah. For the listeners here, it's kind of like a, on one ring of the donut is the environmental limits of the planet. The other ring of the donut is lifting people up to living a better life with more equity, more justice, more health, more economic opportunity for everyone. And kind of how do we balance those two things, the limits of the planet, but also the aspirations and opportunities of all humankind. Uh, it's a pretty neat framework and worth looking at. No doubt, no doubt. Um, the destruction by big ag of the, um, I think one of the most important and all encompassing portions of that uh, that donut framework, that donut economical uh, economic framework, is the destruction of agroecology. Um, we're talking about a uh, practice mm-hmm. that has been in existence for a millennia, you know, thousands and thousands of years, and this uh, push to destroy and move towards the industrial agricultural uh, framework um, from uh, poisonous uh, fertilizers and uh, pesticides to um, these uh, um, um, not under undiverse <laughs> monoculture type uh, plants and plantations and, and food sources it's just been um, it's it's really scary because very few make a lot of money off of the destruction of the livelihoods of these people, um, of the people of the global south. And um, it's just, uh, it's really, really, really disgusting. So let's turn, uh, let's switch gears just a little bit, Dr. Foley. Dr. Jonathan Foley, folks, that is who I'm speaking to. He is a world-renowned environmentalist scientist, environmental scientist, sustainability expert, author, and public speaker, if you haven't noticed. And uh, Dr. Foley's groundbreaking research and insights have led him to become a trusted advisor to governments, foundations, non-governmental organizations, and business leaders around the world. And I was able to get him 
for the show today. I'm very excited. Thanks to Miss Jamie Alexander, who we're going to hear in the second half of the show. So, Dr. Jonathan Foley, IPCC report versus Project Drawdown. Let's do a, a, a let's see, we've got about another five, 10 minutes here. Let's do a breakdown. What did the IPCC report say or didn't say? in comparison to what Project Drawdown has been talking about or started talking about, has solutions for. Go ahead. Yeah, well, um, the IPCC report, as I mentioned before, was um, is, again, a, a very, very large international diplomatic and scientific process. So it includes, you know, literally thousands of different voices and lots and lots of studies. And it takes many, many years to complete uh, our work is, you know, we're a much smaller organization and we can move a little more quickly and we're more interested in sharing this with the broader public in some ways. So they're broadly analogous, but, um, and they said a lot of the same things. Um, where we, uh, you know, are very much in lockstep with each, each other is the need to move away from fossil fuels in electricity and transportation, how we heat our buildings, all those kinds of things. Absolutely. You know, how we use and produce uh, energy and all those different ways. Um, other areas that IPCC has historically not paid as much attention to, but is beginning to pay more, is around agriculture and land use, because that's really, really important. Um, also, the role of nature in not just preventing climate change pollution, but maybe absorbing some of it back down to the earth, putting it back into trees, into soils, into ocean ecosystems, things like that. Can There's I, a little bit of that in the IPCC report, but uh, we, we focus on that much, much more. Okay, okay. Um, let, me, let me interrupt you really quick, though, Doc, but let me interrupt you because yeah. why do you think that is? Because I want to drill down some more because I don't want, you know, I'm not trying to make you repeat yourself or anything like that. I do not want to waste our precious time, right? Why do you think the IPCC report did not drill down on those important points, like the, the destruction of agroecology in, in the global south. Why do, why do you think that is? Go ahead. Well, no, I mean, um, no, to be fair, I mean, the IPCC does include the problems uh, are well recognized uh, from the greenhouse gas part of agricultural pollution. Uh, we know that about, you know, most of it comes from deforestation, uh, clearing places like the Amazon or Indonesia for palm oil, for animal feed, for growing more cattle, uh, these big, huge monocultures that don't feed the world's most food insecure people. They're mostly for cash crops or whatever. And um, yeah, th these are really destructive practices and we've got to knock that off. Um, another big area of emissions comes from uh, cattle themselves. We have so, you know, billions and billions of animals burping on this planet every day uh, <laughs> to feed us more beef and more dairy products than we probably should be eating in at least the rich countries. We've got to think about that in a hard way. And then uh, fertilizer use turns out to be a pretty big source of greenhouse gas emissions, but it's mainly the form of nitrous oxide, uh, N2O, when we overuse fertilizers or manure. This is true for organic fertilizer as well. Uh, if we overuse it, uh, the nitrogen in the manure or the fertilizer combines with air and so water in the soil and outgasses this, this funny little thing called nitrous oxide, which is a heat trapping gas, just like CO2. So sorry to nerd out on that. But yeah, the IPCC and Drawdown you know, both recognize that. We just looked into the solution set maybe a little bit more than, than was published in IPCC so far. Um, most of the models used in the IPCC were focusing mostly on energy stuff and maybe a little less on agriculture. Uh, we've just looked a bit more in agriculture, I think, just relative emphasis. There's nothing sinister about either one. It's just kind of we've looked at that a little bit more. Um, and so we've looked at things like uh, different forms of regenerative agriculture, um, different forms of um, what, you, what you've been calling agroecology, but, you know, kind of different ways we can kind of farm differently, including indigenous community methods, including, you know, traditional practices like, you know, agroforestry. Um, maybe some new spins on that, but also precision agriculture, some high-tech approaches, but that are meant to be good to the environment, not just good to the bottom line of a big company. And that helps too. But most of all, we get to protect rainforest. We've got to uh, cut back our waste of food. We spend a lot more time talking about food waste and dietary shifts, I think. Um, but, you know, I think the list are broadly similar, just we tend to focus a bit more on these solutions. And I think our numbers rank these a little bit higher than the IPCC report did as an opportunity. But, you know, this is where we get to kind of sift this all out and see what the issues are. But where we all agree is, again, like uh, efficiency, 
and pivoting to a greener way of doing things in electricity and food and everything else is broadly the same kind of story. Um, what's also interesting in both is that we find that in both kind of analyses, um, a lot of these solutions are cost effective now. In fact, they would save us money, not just cost very little, they would save us money immediately and be good ideas, especially things like energy efficiency or adding to our electricity supply with cheaper solar and wind instead of expensive gas or nuclear. You know, things like that make sense. Saving, uh, reducing food waste makes sense. A lot of these things are just kind of common sense solutions that are good for people, good for the planet and good for our pocketbooks. And uh, both of those agree too, which is really nice to see. And also that um, a lot of, um, you know, the solutions are like within reach today that they're available now. And we don't have to wait for years and years of lab research for them to be effective today. Um, I know we're running out of time here, but I guess the thing that I would really want to emphasize is the speed of what we have to do. Uh, we have to move fast. And time is the most important variable of all when you address climate change. It's way more important than technology. Uh, we have the same time is more important than tech. And um, so we use the tools we have today to get started and hopefully drop in better tools as we go over the next 10 to 20, 30 years to address climate change. We get better at it with better tools. But the only thing was non-negotiable now is time because we've wasted far too much of it. Dr. Jonathan Foley. Oh, my goodness. What an amazing uh, start to many conversations. I hope. Folks, again, Dr. Jonathan Foley is a world-renowned environmental scientist, sustainability expert, author, and public speaker. He is the executive director of Project Drawdown, projectdrawdown.org. His work is focused on understanding our changing planet and finding new solutions to sustain the climate, ecosystems, and natural resources we all depend on. He is not a lightweight. He knows what he's talking about. Check out projectdrawdown.org. So, Dr. Jonathan Foley, thank you so much for being on A Rude Awakening. Um, if you want to hang out, that would be great because I'm going to switch gears just a little bit and talk about the policy side of what Project Drawdown does with Ms. Jamie Beck Alexander after this break. Thank you so much for being on the show, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is A Rude Awakening. I'm Sabrina Jacobs. Part two of the IPCC report. Report back, if you would. And uh, folks, that is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And they're like a faction, if you would, of the United Nations. So they came out with their sixth report. Came out on the 4th of April. And we're going to talk about the policy side with Miss Jamie Alexander. Miss Jamie Alexander, oh, let's see, Drawdown Labs. She's the founding director of Drawdown Labs. I want to say thank you so much for being on A Rude Awakening once again. How are you? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me. All right. So, yeah, always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. So you joined the, you joined the Project Drawdown team from Sarah's, where you led the corporate engagement on the West Coast, working with companies to set ambitious emission reduction targets and leveraging their influence in support of strong climate and clean energy policies. Wonderful. So... It's all about uh, getting people unstuck. Um, I think it was great that uh, Dr. Foley, Dr. Jonathan Foley left us with that, that, that drumbeat of why are we navel gazing? <laughs> I couldn't have said it better myself. I tell you, why are we yeah. navel gazing on these policies? Um, well, so let me ask you, why are we not, uh, as you put it in the Project Drawdown or Drawdown Lab language lingo, not scaling as we should as a society? Um, what, why, what, what is it going to take to get us to that point where policy is in place, we're making a difference, the sky stops falling? Go ahead. That is the question, I think. What is it going to take? I ask myself that just about every day. Um, yeah, I mean, that's really what what our work is at Drawdown Labs. You know, John said, 
um, that we need, you know, time is the biggest factor right now. We need to swiftly and, um, and in a massive way scale climate solutions so rapidly and comprehensively that they displace the things we're doing that are incompatible with a livable world, right? That's what, that's what, that's the work ahead of us. And so we, within Drawdown Labs, we sort of have identified, okay, what are the big movers in society? Like what are the big sort of leverage points that we have um, in our current economic system? You can argue whether, you know, whether we actually, whether our current economic system is you know, compatible with a, with a thriving world. Mm. Since we're in that economic system now, we sort of t- tap those actors to try to, you know, exploit their leverage and influence and resources to scale climate solutions in the world. That's sort of our, um, that's why we exist uh, in the part of the organization that I run. Um, because we need to move as, as quickly as humanly possible and large corporations Big investment firms have a lot of capital to deploy. They have a lot of influence at the policy level. Um, they have a lot of, you know, cultural influence. Um, and we're barely scratching the surface of them using that in, for positive climate action. Um, so that's what that's what we work on. Yeah, that's um, yeah. That, oh my gosh, yeah, leverage. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Somebody needs to be leveraging what uh, what these folks have, and and you know, there's a reason why that why they have so much, and uh, it's because they've been leveraging us. They've been leveraging, you know, the indigenous people of the global south. They've been leveraging the poor to make their money in a lot of these situations. So, I mean. It's um, you know, have you seen any movement from doing what you do as a policy advisor, as a you know, as an influencer towards positive policy as far as this climate crisis is concerned to try and save us all? Have you seen any type of movement in what you've been doing, Jamie Alexander? Go ahead. There, I mean, there has been progress. Definitely, I've been working on you know in this in this space for a while now. Um, there has been progress. I mean, I think there are, there are a few, you know, policy is one, one important mechanism, right? We need policy in place to help accelerate the scaling of climate solutions. We need policy in place to remove the barriers to scaling climate solutions, to disincentivize fossil fuels and incentivize, you know, getting um, just climate solutions out in the world. We also need investment. You know, the IPCC report called for three to six times current levels of, uh, of finance getting to climate solutions every year that aligns with uh, with project drawdowns assessment as well um we need you know I mean so so policy is one very very important big leverage point that can help move the entire you know that can move all of us forward but we also need investment we also need um you know people employed bringing climate solutions into the world we need people who can like install heat pumps and solar panels and you know practice regenerative agriculture uh, you know farming techniques we need people who can you know can bring these solutions into the world at scale um so there are you know pol- but policy is a really really important one um i work with large corporations and um and investors to try to leverage their clout at the political level um so we try to, you know, make the case that if if businesses are serious about their, um, you know, their climate promises that we've all heard so much about, um, then they would be, lob- you know, they would be at city hall, they would be at, you know, the, on the hill, they would be at, they would be loudly and unequivocally advocating for climate policy because they'll need that those policies in place in order for them to actually be able to meet their climate targets. Um, so we work to kind of sort of aggregate um, the, I'll have the support of these major employers at their backs, but we also need investment, massive amounts of capital deployed toward climate solutions. We need people trained and equipped and, you know, in jobs that, that are, you know, equipped to install heat pumps and solar panels and practice regenerative agriculture um, techniques. And so, so we, so we need policy and we need investment and we need people and jobs and we need aggregated individual behavior change. But policy is one of the most important things. And it's one of the things that we work on within Drawdown Labs, um, trying to convince, you know, and, and then aggregate the business voice 
to give legislators the confidence that they'll they have that that legislators have the support of the business community at their backs to pass bold climate policy. Um, one of my I firmly believe that if companies, you know, when when you hear about this like a a new climate commitment from a, a company, one of the ways that I sort of kind of do a gut check to to understand um, if that company is serious about that climate commitment or if it's greenwashing is are they stepping up on policy matters when it you know at, at the at the federal level and the state level if they are then that tells me that those climate goals are authentic and you know and that that they're that they're on their way if if they don't then then i i question the authenticity of those of those climate commitments mm-hmm. um i mean i think you know so far we have not seen the 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 federal movement that that we've really been hoping to see the the build back better act um, you know, was on sort of a roller coaster of emotions for a lot of us, up and down, and um, and not yet passed through the reconciliation package. Um, we're still hoping that when Congress comes back from recess, that that'll be um, on their plates. And we are, you know, keeping up the drumbeat that we need that to happen. You know, we need those, you know, the the investments in that. Um, in that reconciliation package to be able to meet our climate targets. Um, so it's it's really, really critical. And um, and we're trying to pull out all the stops, um, use all the the uh, the influence we have to be able to to try to to try to get that across the line. No doubt. No doubt. Um, and it it uh, it looks like there is that possibility. Last week I did a um, did a did the full show on the destruction of agroecology in Africa. There's 13 countries in Africa that the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation through their organization, Agra, sorry to repeat this folks, (laughs) folks who've been listening to this show have heard me go on and on and on about it, but there was a closed congressional hearing about U.S. aid funding the destruction of agroecology in those 13 countries in Africa through Agra, the so-called green revolution. Green washing is what it is. Ooh. Basically, they're incorporating big ag practices, um, you know, cancer causing fertilizers and pesticides, you know, monoculture uh, plant seeds and whatnot that they have to pay for. It. They have not improved hunger in Africa in any way, shape, or form. So the fact that that went to Congress, finally, you know, finally it went to Congress. They've been doing this for 15 years, destroying, destroying these countries in Africa, 13 countries in Africa. It finally went to Congress so that our tax dollars aren't doing it. So there is that hope. But as far as what you're seeing and what you're doing and and being an influencer on the policy side of trying to save this planet, does, you know, does, does what was included in the IPCC report as far as solutions are concerned, as far as policy is concerned, um, does that carry any leverage with these people at all? That is a is a very complex system and often um, incentivizing not the best things mm-hmm. in, in the countries where they work. So, um, yeah, I appreciate your, your digging in on that topic. That's, that's an important one. Mm-hmm. Um, does the IPCC report matter? Will it will it change like the hearts and minds of legislators? Is that is that what you're asking, Sabrina? Yeah, that's what I'm asking. I mean, does it carry any weight, really? I yeah. mean, hearts and minds, that's a moral thing. But actually carrying any weight, are they, are they instilling any type of fear? Because that's what it comes down to. You know, fear is the only thing that's going to combat this level of greed that we're looking at and dealing with. Um, does that carry any weight? Can you go into a, a, a a meeting with uh, the uh, I don't know your you know fill in the blank corporate you know company that's you know just running roughshod on the environment and say look the IPCC report says da 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 it, does that does that hold any hold any, I mean does that does that uh, is there any weight that's carried with that but with saying that with invoking the IPCC with invoking the UN go ahead I I mean. I, I don't think there was much in the IPCC report that was brand new. I mean, we knew, we already knew that we already knew that in every single sector of society, we have the solutions right now, and they're sufficient to ha- to to having our emissions by 2030, which is what we need to do. That's the that's sort of the the, the goalpost right now. Having cutting our emissions in half by 2030, we already knew 
that we had the solutions in every single sector to be able to do that right now, today, even in the industry sector, which is which is the hardest one. Um, so this, you know, will the will this wake people up? I mean, I maybe I guess I I I, I don't think so. <laughs> I have to say I don't think so. I mean, what did did the code red for humanity wake people up when we talked last? Yeah. Did the, you know, the IPCC report on 1.5C in 2018 wake people like I guess so, but I think what is needed is like a full-scale global mobilization around this that does not wait for our leaders to, you know, I, I think time and again we've been we've been disappointed by our political leaders who have not gotten the job done. Um, and so I'm hopeful that this sort of mobilizes people. I'm not, you know, I, I'm not going to take this into the boardroom and be like, oh, Mr. CEO, this is going to change your mind. But I do think this like on an individual level um, that this, this could inspire people. This could like, you know, I think you and I were both feeling like after the last report, it was like, doom and gloom and this now was like wait we have we have the solutions and a big part of this report was the amount of power that individuals have um especially you know when it comes to collective collective action um the un secretary general called for collective action he called out activism as an important tool to be able to move the world forward um so i think yeah, I guess I think on an individual level and on a, and on a movement level, this w this will matter. Um, I don't necessarily think that this will, you know, change things significantly on Capitol Hill or inside boardrooms. Um, but movements, I think, I think are are being strengthened um, by this report. No doubt, no doubt. I think we all have to look at um, Glasgow, you know, last year and how corporatized it was it was just so pretty so pretty and so corporate and so you know the flashy videos they have little clips on youtube and you can check out them you know it's like, okay yeah so what man there's people dying starving because of monsanto you know it's so i think that's a big part of it like you have to look at at some at some moment in time we're gonna have to say look at that report and say okay we just need to stop we just need to stop this we we cannot continue doing this we need to just stop we need to move we need to do we need to move rapidly in this direction but like especially for businesses like at some point you're going to need to stop producing that stuff that is not compatible with the world that we can all live in you know like that is sort of where i'm at like you no know, we just need to stop <laughs> Totally, totally. It's um, yeah. It's, it's we're living in ter terrifying times, and it's uh, the part that the disconnect that I'm not understanding is the greed of these few, the greed of these few corporate entities. It's like how much money do you need to have if there isn't going to be a world for you to spend that money in? Why do you need more of it? You know what I mean? That's the part that I'm not quite understanding. Um, I, I, I applaud the UN. I applaud the IPCC report. I think it's wonderful. That's great that they actually came out with solutions. You know, it's great that they're actually taking a deep dive. And, and I understand that, you know, it's a governmental agency and it's a bureaucracy and everybody's got to be included. And it's got to be this democratic process. Okay, yeah, I get that. However, however... You know, getting your name published or, you know what I mean? It's, 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 it's the fact that people are living on the edge from the frontline communities that are dealing with the pollution here in the United States to the frontline communities all over the global south that are, you know, have been treated and mistreated, had their land and their bodies raped and pillaged by these multinational corporations mm -hmm. and us just signing a, a signing on the dotted line as mm -hmm. american citizens taxpayers european countries it's all over you know it's just across the board i don't need to put the players in place everybody knows what's going on so i just don't understand how much more these people need to validate yeah. themselves you know and that's a moral question but then again not really what are your thoughts jamie go ahead yeah, I mean, well, the, for the first time, the IPCC actually actually called that out in a in a way that I hadn't seen before, where they said that you know wealthier individuals 
have the biggest obligation and the highest potential for emissions reductions. Like they, they, they actually separated out what I would call like luxury emissions. So that's like, you know, your private jets and your like fifth house and your boat versus subsistence emissions, which is I need to grow my food to eat and I need to, you know, take my motorcycle to, you know, to wherever to get, take my kid to the doctor. Like these are different kinds of emissions, right? Like if wealthy people use having their, having their third yacht versus like the farmer in Bangladesh who needs to grow rice to feed his family. So Mm -hmm. for the first time, the IPCC did distinguish between them and said that on the subsistence emission side, there should be a lot more time given and, and, and the like wealthier nations and wealthier individuals have like a hell of a lot more work to do much faster. Um, and so, and they called out, you know, investors, consumers, business leaders in a way that I hadn't seen before. And I think that is fantastic. Um, and the report also, you know, links heavily to the sustainable development goals and says that, you know, that reducing emissions, um, is also, you know, a, is a is a sustainable development, you know, ties to the sustainable de- development goals is better for health, for, you know, for helping people adapt to flood risk and reduce heat island effects. It's better for, you know, it, it's it it has these these really important co-benefits um, while, you know, for, for people, especially in places that have been, um, you know, first hit by climate change and disproportionately affected. And their, you know, their climate solutions. So I think there, this report did speak to that in a way that I hadn't seen before. Um, and I think that's good. I think we do, you know, the, the people most responsible for the problem should have the biggest responsibility to step up and start to address it um, the fastest and make the biggest moves. No doubt, no doubt. Um, you don't have an easy job. <laughs> you know, um, policy, policy, I, it's just, um, I, my head would explode every time I talk to a policymaker or policy influencer in regards to climate change. I'm just like, how do you have the patience to even, you know, listen to the, the servers, if you would, um, of these politicians? You know what I mean? Because it's like they're, when it comes down to it, the, the, the reality is they are bought and paid for. Okay, and I'm sorry if that offends any of you politicians or politician esque or politician folks that are you know hoping to be politicians. Whatever, <laughs> that's the truth. That's what it boils down to, unfortunately. But you yeah. know, and, and how do how you know how do you as a policy person, policy maker, policy influencer turn that to your advantage? And and that's the you know the twenty million thousand dollar question, whatever, right? You know, you don't have to answer it now, Jamie Alexander. But I know you ask yourself that because you know, when we're talking off mic, I'm asking you. You know what I mean? So it's uh, it's not your job is not easy. It's not easy. Um, but the wins are big wins when you do get them. Um, yeah. What would be in, with this IPCC report? Okay, it's got about as much influence as um, I don't know minimal amount, right? Minimal amount of influence. However, it, do you see that as something in your, another piece in the toolbox to get folks to get on board, uh, get these corporate entities on board towards moving in the right direction? Um, is there, you know, what else do you need? Is it, I mean, what is the, what is the, the ideal game plan in the last two minutes we've got here with you? Mm-hmm. Uh, founding director of Drawdown Labs, Jamie Alexander, what would be the ideal uh, setup uh, situation? Um, the and, uh, ideal game plan. I love this yeah. question. <laughs> I love it. Um, let's see. So my ideal game plan, um, I mean, you know, inside the corporate world, I think, I think employee organizing is um, like employees banding together and saying, okay, we see the urgency. Our executives may not, but we have a lot of power. And if we, if we, you know, kind of, if we organize and build our numbers and build our movement, we can have a lot of power. We can question whether the company's moving fast enough. We can hold them accountable. We can use our own skills and, you know, to, to support this work. We like, 
I've seen employees organize around specific policies, like, you know, our company should be stepping up on this big policy that's coming up and employees organize to pressure their company publicly to support it because, you know, employees get it. They, and they're not tied to quarterly returns like their executives are. So they, they often see the issue much more clearly. Um, so, I mean, game plan, I think big movements of concerned employees inside companies rising up and saying like enough is enough we need to use every bit of our power as a you know as, as a company um, and every bit of our access to be to change things to use our political clout to get policies passed um that's that that's sort of the game plan that i'm on right now and um to me that's you know that's that's where my my hope is. It's on individual people who are passionate and build their, you know, build movements inside companies and and change things from the inside and bring the rest of the sector with them. I think that's um, that's the game plan that I'm uh, that, I, that, that that's the game that I'm playing right now. Yeah. Um, and that's what gives me the most the most life right now. No doubt. And that's what's yeah. up, actually. I mean, that's some serious yeah. union organizing you're talking about. That same type of uh, structure. But yeah. Uh, we don't want to give it all away, right? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> we'll save that for next time. Oh, yeah. Most definitely. Most definitely. Folks, oh, my goodness. What an amazing conversation. I hope you liked it, too. I was just speaking with Jeannie, or that was the voice of Jeannie Beck Alexander, solution oriented corporate climate advocate, coalition builder, founding director of Drawdown Labs. Wow. Jamie Beck Alexander, thank you so much. Um, folks, again, check out projectdrawdown.org. Check out projectdrawdown.org. It is time well spent. It's not all doom and gloom. Um, there are solutions there. And they talk about those solutions. And uh, also, Jamie, we didn't even get to, <laughs> I didn't even mention, Jamie Beck, Jamie Beck Alexander also has a piece in uh, greenbiz.com. Greenbiz.com came out on the 6th of April. Solutions to the climate crisis will come from the multitudes. Solutions to the climate crisis will come from the multitudes. And that is mm-hmm. response to the IPCC report, their sixth edition talking about solutions. Jamie, thank you so much for being on A Root Awakening once again. Thank you so much. Appreciate you taking the time. Such a pleasure. Thanks, Sabrina. Again, good people, check out the latest piece by Jamie Beck Alexander in greenbiz.com, greenbiz.com, entitled Solutions to the Climate Crisis Will Come from the Multitudes. Ain't that the truth? It's a response to the policy side of the IPCC's latest report on how to solve the climate crisis. But uh, I would check out Jamie's article first. And that does it for another edition of A Rude Awakening. I'm Sabrina Jacobs. A big thank you to my guests. Dr. Jonathan Foley and Ms. Jamie Alexander for taking the time. Man of Steel, Rodicule is on the controls. I'll be back next week. Same time, same place. Stay tuned for a rebroadcast of Democracy Now! coming up next. And remember, good people, embrace each other as we embrace the mother of us all. Thank you for listening. Dan Dunbar Ortiz. The group made serious demands for five institutions to be established on Alcatraz. And why don't we have them yet? A Center for Native American Studies, an American Indian Spiritual Center, and an Indian Center of Ecology that would do scientific research on reversing pollution of water and air. A great Indian training school that would run a restaurant, provide job training, market indigenous arts, and teach the, quote, noble and tragic events of Indian history, including the Trail of Tears and the Massacre of Wounded Knee. And a memorial, a reminder that the island had been established as a prison initially to incarcerate and execute California Indian resistors to U.S. assault on their nations. Advancing the conversation to abolish racism for over 70 years. 94.1 KPFA. Just for you on your birthday, we love you very much, so have a fucking birthday. April 15th, KPFA turned 73 years young. Most of us think of KPFA as a friend that we've grown older with. 
a friend whose mission is based on the high idea of what radio and the community it serves can produce together. We're celebrating the station's fortitude and our Vigilance Award winners, and you, our staunch supporters who have kept us in the game since 1949. Make a birthday donation today to keep KPFA independent, innovative, and vigilant as always. Thank you. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA and 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz, 94.3 K232FZ in Monterey, and online worldwide at kpfa.org. 